And uh, our next presenter is uh, Professor Ariel Weisman. He graduated from medical school in Jerusalem and uh, had a scientific and uh, clinical fellowship uh, with Bob Casper at uh, Toronto University in Canada. And uh, currently he is part uh, of the IVF unit at the Department of Obstetric and Gynecology at the Wolfson Medical Center, affiliated to the Tel Aviv University, where he also holds the position of associate professor. And he is one of the authors of well, one of the very important textbooks on assisted technologies in laboratory and clinical uh, perspectives. So please, Ariane. Thank you for the kind introduction. Good afternoon. Thank you, Zev and Milton, for your kind invitation. So my topic is a, a controlled ovarian hyperstimulation versus personalized preparation of the ovaries for egg collection. And uh, many of the speakers uh, in the last two days, both basic and the clinical uh, science, have, have already touched some of the uh, topics that I, I will address, so I've made my work a little easier. And why doesn't it move? Forward. Could you help me, please? It's not moving. Ah, okay, okay, that's backwards, okay. So, this is a key publication from The Lancet more than 30 years ago from the Howard Jacobs Group. This is what later became to be known as the Long Protocol, and it's more than 30 years that we've been using successfully both initially the GnRH agonist and then uh, also the GnRH antagonist that gradually uh, lower the cancellation rate, increase the number of oocyte retrieved, higher pregnancy and life birth rates, and with antagonists also uh, increase patient's convenience and increase safety for the treatment. But it's been now more than 30 years that we've been using, uh, combining these in, in our simulation protocol, and here, still here in this meeting, we are asking whether less is more and more is less, and we still haven't found a way to uh, use this, uh, 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 to have the, the optimal regimens for uh, preparation of uh, the ovary. The way we stimulate the ovary affects all the key players in that, that are necessary for successful implantation and these are the embryo, the endometrium, and also the maternal immune system. I will only touch today the, the first two, the embryo and the endometrium. And uh, there are many uh, factors to be considered when we are to plan the stimulation. The success of the IVF cycle is clearly dependent about the size and the quality of the oocyte coat, as, as it has been mentioned uh, yesterday and today. Uh, uh, it is dependent on the type and the dose of the gonadotropins that uh, uh, we use, the regimen of pituitary suppression that we choose, and the type of ovulatory trigger, which also affects the type of uh, uh, the regimen for luteal support, and also the administration of adjuvant agents, which I will not uh, uh, address. So, and, and nowadays, we're talking, when we're talking about stimulations, we're talking about two kinds of uh, cycles. One is the, is the standard fresh IVF cycle, and now the segmented IVF cycle, where the uh, retrieval and the transfer are separated, is also becoming popular. Sometimes it is planned to be a segmented cycle, and sometimes the fresh IVF cycle is become switched into a segmented cycles for reasons that I will uh, show. So first, uh, again, I'm going to touch briefly the size and the quality of the oocyte uh, cohort. And uh, it is now, uh, uh, we, we've realized, uh, as I will show, that the op optimal size of the cohort and I'm talking, my talk is restricted to patients that are expected to be normal responders, not projector high, projected high responder PCOS or 
a projected low responses, but for the normal responses, the optimal size of the cohort that we expect, we, we would like to have is between eight and 15 oocytes. So if we stimulate uh, more vigorously, there is a disturbed risk-benefit bal balance because of the risk for OHSS. And if we uh, under-stimulate, then we put the patients under the, the atrogenic disadvantages of uh, being a poor responder. So uh, where does these figure, uh, figures arise from? This is the uh, Sunkara paper summarizing uh, more than 400,000 cycles in the UK, showing that live birth rate uh, tend to uh, plateau after 15 to 20 oocytes. And we have similar uh, data coming from the United States, a summary of a huge SART database showing that live birth rates seem to uh, plateau at around between 16 and 20 oocytes. But above that, in a fresh cycle, the risk for OHSS is a, a significantly and unacceptably uh, increased. So uh, this is the size that we would like to have. And the next question is, does the size of the cohort affect the oocyte quality? As have, has been already discussed, so the oocytes is the largest cell in the female body. It uh, the cytoplasmic maturation and quality should be sufficient to support normal chromosome segregation. But that doesn't mean, still, that doesn't mean a successful implantation. We have very limited access to, stud access to study oocyte quality. But now, uh, with the uh, increased popularity of PGS, this is one way to look at oocyte and embryo quality, the aneuploidy. So uh, first question is, is there, does stimulation adversely affect the oocytes in terms of aneuploidy? As Antonio Pellicer has already mentioned, the EV study, this is data from uh, RMA New Jersey, courtesy of uh, Dr. Frenziak. And this is the natural cycle study comparing the aneuploidy rates in uh, oocytes that arise from a completely natural cycle versus stimulated cycles. And you can see that for all age group, the aneuploidy rate is identical completely identical, whether it's coming from a non-stimulated cycle or whether it's coming from a stimulated cycle. So this, this is the effect of stimulation. And then the size of the cohort similarly, oops, sorry, sorry about that. The size of the cohort, you see that even with large cohorts, the aneuploidy rate is identical whether it's a, it's a, a medium-sized cohort or a, a very large cohort. For younger and for older patients, the aneuploidy rates are identical. So at least if we, if we are trying to look at equality and embryo quality in terms of uh, aneuploidy, then a, an, an embryonic aneuploidy rates do not differ in natural cycle following mild stimulation or following intense stimulation with, with large cohorts of oocytes. And these data do not support a causative role for gonadotropin stimulation in embryonic aneuploidy. But as I said, aneuploidy is not uh, everything. And there are more players. There's also the endometrium. And as I said, uh, as I already mentioned, about 50% of unemployed uh, uh, blastocysts never implant. Next is the type of gonadotropin that is given, uh, uh, LH and FSH. We are all familiar with the synergistic and synchronized actions of these, of these two uh, gonadotropins. At the follicular level, they are crucial to achieve adequate steroidogenesis for proper oocyte maturation and endometrial development. Uh, there's always the question to, LA, to use LH or not to use LH. Dr. Simone has already uh, addressed this, uh, partially addressed this question today. Uh, the physiological role of LH during the follicular phase of a natural cycle is unquestionable. Its impact during control of ovarian stimulation remains controversial. And to date, there seems to be no clear benefit obtained by combining LH and FSH 
in unselected normal gonadotropic patients accepted, uh, expected a normal responder. There is some data suggested, suggesting that in patients with advanced maternal age, as already mentioned today, here this, uh, as, as in the study by Bosch from, from EV Spain, Bosch et al., uh, there is some role for the additional of LH, in this case recombinant uh, FSH. Here you can see implantation rates in young patients uh, are identical, but uh, in, in patients in the age group of 36 to 39, a significantly improved implantation rate and a tendency uh, for uh, improved ongoing pregnancy rate with the additional age. And there's also a, a meta-analysis uh, looking at the addition of recombinant LH in patients with uh, advanced reproductive age by Hill et al. from 2012, showing that uh, both embryo implantation and clinical pregnancy are uh, significantly improved with the addition of recombinant LH to the stimulation protocol. But as already mentioned, this is a controversial issue and there are studies and also meta-analysis uh, that uh, and are not in agreement with this one. And perhaps it is, a, it is as Dr. Simone already mentioned today, it makes a difference whether it is HMG or, a, or, a, or LH. Uh, and the HCG content also of the, of the uh, molecule that is used. So uh, with regard to the addition of LH, uh, apart from the arbitrary, uh, there is still a, a no clear benefit of the addition uh, of LH except for uh, uh, perhaps for the older age group. Uh, perhaps through a higher synthesis of androgens, which are diminished in older women. And this, uh, this way, uh, the quality of simulation is improved. But until now, apart from the arbitrary criteria of age, there is a lack of an appropriate biomarker uh, to determine the need of an age in control of ovarian stimulation if a given, in a given patient. Next is uh, the regimen of pituitary suppression that uh, is used. It took a very long time until, uh, at least in, in terms of evidence based, we were convinced that the uh, agonist and the antagonist are equally effective in terms of ongoing and, and, and uh, live birth rate. Uh, antagonists also offer uh, significant improvements in terms of safety, not only by uh, reducing the risk of severe OHSS, but also uh, by giving us the opportunity to use the agonist trigger and to prevent, this is a very efficient intervention, to prevent OHSS. And antagonists also uh, offer convenience, which increase patient compliance because of the shorter stimulation, less injections, and uh, perhaps with the improved compliance, there is a, a lower degree of dropout uh, for treatment. Uh, there is a problem for some patients with antagonists with the uh, uh, greater degree of heterogeneity in the size of the follicle in some patients from uh, daily experience for some patients it does uh, make a difference and it may compromise uh, the outcome but there are ways also to get around with that like for example using uh, lutal interventions like lutal estradiol or a, a, a contraceptive pills some patients uh, 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 may perhaps enjoy, still enjoy, and uh, uh, have advantage of having a long uh, GnRH agonist protocol. Perhaps patients with endometriosis or those with, as I mentioned, accelerated folliculogenesis. Uh, but there is a lack of an appropriate biomarket that can deter, uh, help us determine a priori which patient would benefit for, uh, from a GnRH agonist protocol. So I believe in, a, in the majority of clinics worldwide, 
the uh, analog of choice, the regimen of choice is today the GNRH antagonist protocol. Next is the ovulatory trigger. We now have several options. It's only, of course, only when, when we're using an antagonist protocol, we have a few uh, uh, possibilities to trigger. Uh, the traditional HCG, and then the GNRH agonist trigger, and there's also the dual trigger, which is a combination of both uh, HCG and a GNRH agonist. And uh, the agonist, the, the trigger that we choose uh, will also affect the regimen for luteal support that uh, uh, we, will, uh, we will choose and we will administer as you will hear from, from the next speaker, I will uh, only briefly say that if we are uh, given an agonist trigger, we have several options, uh, including intensive luteal support and different means of using low doses of HCG, adjuvant low doses of HCG. Recombinant LH has also been mentioned in this context, and there's also a freeze-all uh, uh, possibility if we are to use a, an agonist trigger. Uh, there is a very recent study from Israel by uh, Bar Chava et al., uh, who showed very elegantly in patients at very high risk for uh, OHSS who had an agonist trigger, they only used a nafaril and cinerel twice daily uh, from the evening of the egg retrieval as the sole agent for luteal support, and they only used it until uh, the pregnancy test, and they have shown a very nicely a favorable uh, progesterone and estradiol levels, me both mid-luteal and also at the time of uh, a positive uh, pregnancy test. So this is in high responder, and just last week, uh, it's in press from the same group, they have summarized a, a much larger a group of, a, of patients treated with GNRH antagonist protocol, receiving only intranasal nepharaline for two weeks as a regimen for luteal support. Again, showing a very, favor, very high and favorable mid-luteal estradiol and progesterone levels compared to, a, this is retrospective by the way, uh, compared to conventional uh, progesterone luteal support. There is also recently a, an increased popularity uh, for the dual trigger. There is a, a potential biological uh, role for FSH surge at the time of the final oocyte maturation. It relates both to GnRH agonist trigger and to the dual trigger, and why is that? because FSH stimulates plasminogen activator activity within the granulosa cells. It is involved in dissociating the oocytes from the follicular wall and weakening the wall to facilitate rupture. It improved oocyte recovery are reported with higher follicular fluid FSH levels. FSH promotes prom uh, the formation of LH receptor in luteinized uh, granulosa cells. It keeps the gap junctions between the oocytes and the cumulus cells, and it promotes nuclear maturation and cumulus expansion. So uh, there are a, a not, I, I'm not familiar with prospective studies yet, but at least a, a several, there are several reports that are promising, uh, just uh, for example this one, by Griffin et al. showing a significantly higher proportion of mature oocytes in patients with a previous history of more than 25% uh, of immature oocytes. And in normal responders, this is a study from Taiwan by Lin et al., in normal responders undergoing a GnRH antagonist cycle, more, more M2 oocytes significantly improved implantation, clinical pregnancy, and live birth rate. Perhaps they suggest through improved endometrial receptivity through uh, an effect uh, on the endometrium. So here we come to the endometrium. Uh, it, with regard to the endometrium, there is an ongoing, there was an ongoing debate 
on the impact uh, of high serum progesterone levels during the late follicular phase, their effect on IVF outcome. Uh, in the majority of cases, and not uh, like in the patient population that uh, Norbert described today, the poor responders, as he mentioned, the progesterone levels was a sign of uh, premature luteinization. But in the majority of normal responder patients that are stimulation, uh, increased serum progesterone may be observed during the last few days of ovarian stimulation, but they do not reflect premature luteinization because the risk of uh, endogenous late surge is effectively controlled by the use of, of the GnRH analogs. Uh, it is primarily related to hyperfunction of uh, granulosa cells, uh, and it is related to the intensity of the ovarian uh, stimulation and the response to FSH. It is correlated with the number of follicles, with the number of oocytes, and the mean estradiol level. And as you will see, it is also dependent on the studied population. So there was an ongoing debate, but the debate has a, a almost completely, it was finished with the publication of the meta-analysis by uh, Venetis et al. in 2013, showing that uh, for uh, uh, increased progesterone levels, uh, summarizing more than six, uh, 60,000 cycles, uh, with increased progesterone levels as low as uh, 0.8 nanograms per milliliter, uh, pregnancy rates were already uh, compromised. And uh, with the increase in progesterone level, this effect is, is more obvious. And uh, 1.5 nanograms per mil is now considered uh, by many authors and uh, by many clinics as the threshold uh, uh, for uh, an adverse uh, effect of the progesterone elevation. It is interesting, how do we know that this is an endometrial and not an oocyte or embryo effect? And this is simply because in the same meta-analysis, it has been shown that in uh, the frozen cycles or in uh, cycles in, uh, in donor, uh, uh, using donor eggs, there is no uh, effect of, at all of, uh, for the progesterone level on the likelihood of implantations of the embryos that originated from these cycles. So how, this, how is the uh, elevated progesterone effective, the, affecting the endometrium? We know that in, sim, in a stimulated cycle, the endometrium is already advanced by about two days. But with higher, uh, with higher progesterone level, the degree of uh, advancement is even higher, and uh, there are very, very uh, nice and elegant several studies from uh, different groups using diff different platforms showing that uh, uh, there is a distinct difference in the endometrial gene expressions, which is altered. And, uh, genes that are associated with endometrial uh, receptivity, are, uh, their expression is impaired, uh, moderately altered receptivity in 86, stronger altered receptivity in 14%. So it is a, an endometrial effect for the progesterone. And uh, we know that serum progesterone at the time of HCG triggering is significantly higher in women treated with GnRH agonist as compared to GnRH antagonist. And with a stronger ovarian response, the stronger the ovarian response and uh, uh, is, is uh, as we see it, uh, uh, in a difference of about two oocytes in favor of the agonist. And this is probably a, uh, the reason why, uh, uh, with, this, uh, with the intensity of response, uh, there is a greater likelihood of increased progesterone levels in, uh, in agonist cycles 
as compared to antagonist cycles. It is not only the uh, degree uh, of uh, progesterone elevation, it is also the duration. As we see here that with increased duration, uh, there is a, a greater effect of uh, increased progesterone effect. The longer the duration of exposure to high progesterone, the lower the clinical pregnancy rate. How am I doing with the time? Uh, we're over. Okay, so, so uh, I will just uh, address one more, uh, there's just one more thing that I will address. So uh, in terms of, again, we go back to LH or not LH, or not LH, to use or not to use LH in the stimulation. There are studies suggesting that with, if we include LH in the stimulation regimen, the likelihood of increased progesterone level is uh, reduced. As uh, we can see here in this uh, study from uh, uh, Werner et al., this is from Richard Scott, uh, looking at the likelihood for uh, increased progesterone levels in the ratio between LH and FSH in the molecule that is used for stimulation. And we see that uh, if the ratio is between uh, uh, 0.3 to 0.6, then the likelihood, actually two to one, uh, to simplify, the likelihood is uh, the least. And um, uh, this is true for all uh, kinds of response, for high responders, for low responders, with 0.3 to 0.6 or two to one, the likelihood of progesterone elevation is uh, the least. So uh, how, how I will just summarize, uh, uh, and I will, uh, I will finish soon, about the progesterone elevation. Progesterone elevation is strongly correlated, as I said, to the intensity of the stimulation. Measurement of certain progesterone is required before ovulation triggering. We should know about that. Uh, this is another thing, is that the threshold should be individually defined for each center because there are many pitfalls in the assays that are used and differences. And the starting FSH, though, should be individually adjusted, as I mentioned, as, as to have the stimulation not too intense uh, in, order, in order to get 8 to 12 oocytes. And the GnRH antagonist, at least in this sense, is preferred. And also there's a notion not to increase the dose of FSH in the last few days of stimulation because the granulosa cells become highly sensitive to FSH. And the use of LH activity products, as I mentioned, uh, perhaps in the ratio of two to one, it is one suggested, a suggestion but is controversial. So what should we do in case we see a gradual increase in serum progesterone during the stimulation? Uh, first is to consider triggering earlier, because uh, the longer we stimulate, then the higher the uh, progesterone levels will be. It has been mentioned that uh, by Fanchin et al., the uh, administration of dexamethasone during ovarian stimulation may reduce the adrenal contribution to progesterone uh, secretion. In my experience, it works very well. I'm not sure it's only, it only works on the adrena. Uh, we should not cancel the oocyte retrieval. Uh, as we said, it does not impact oocyte quality. We should simply uh, turn this cycle into a deferred cycle, freeze the whole cohort, and transfer later. And uh, I think uh, I will stop here. Thank you. Thank you.